Hello, and welcome to the Dissident Mama podcast. Today, my guest is the Reverend Dr. Brian Patrick Mitchell. He earned his PhD in theology from the University of Winchester in the United Kingdom. He is a former soldier, journalist, corporate spokesman, and cabinet level speechwriter. He was for many years the Washington Bureau Chief of Investors Business Daily and is the author of six books on politics and religion, including Origins Revenge, The Greek and Hebrew Roots of Christian Thinking on Male and Female, The Disappearing Deaconess, Why the Church Once Had Deaconesses and Then Stopped Having Them, and Eight Ways to Run the Country, which has been used to teach politics at Yale and elsewhere. Dr. Mitchell has appeared on dozens of radio and TV shows and has been a guest speaker at Harvard University, the University of Pennsylvania, University of Connecticut, Catholic University of America, George Mason, Rose Hill College, and Holy Trinity Orthodox Seminary. He is a convert to the Orthodox Church and a proto-deacon of the Russian Orthodox Church outside Russia, attached to St. John the Baptist Russian Orthodox Cathedral in Washington, D.C., so welcome, and I will say welcome, Father. You'll be Father Patrick to me, but you also have all these other hats you wear and all other names, but welcome, Father. Thank you. Great to be here. Yes, so um, you had reached out to me to um, kind of introduce me to your work, and you know, I, I'd heard about the whole push for deaconesses. It was actually one of the first things I heard about coming into orthodoxy back in 2016 and 2017, because... I was kind of feeling out orthodoxy and asking questions. And, you know, there were some women at my church who said, oh, you know, um, there's some people who push for deaconesses, but it's not that big of a deal. Nobody really takes them seriously. And mm -hmm. then my priest at the time had said, yes, if that ever happened, there would probably be a schism. So that may be the very last question I ask you in this interview. Will there be a schism over this? But hopefully we we can stop it in, a tra in its tracks today. So um, you have written a book, um, quite a few books, but um, the one that I was uh, referencing in the intro, The Disappearing Deaconess and also Origins Revenge, speak a lot to this topic. So um, why don't you uh, first tell me what you think the bigger issue when it comes to deaconesses is? Because I have a lot of listeners who aren't Orthodox, but we're also going to be talking about feminism at large as well, which affects all of us. So what what's one of the bigger issues that you think we need to understand when talking about the deaconess issue? And I am going to put it in air quotes because I've learned a lot from your reading. <laughs> well, uh, uh, let me tell you a little bit more just to sort of set the scene. I I've been writing uh, about sort of gender issues for almost 40 years, 30 years at least. Um, I, I, uh, I hadn't, uh, growing up, I didn't give this much thought until I got to college, and then I happened to stumble across a book in the live, in the bookstore in those days uh, called Sexual Suicide by George Gilder. Uh, Gilder, this was in the late 70s. He was not yet a big name, but he went on to become a, a best-selling author. He wrote Wealth and Poverty, bestseller, a couple of series of bestsellers, uh, and uh, made a fortune in the dot-com business, uh, the whole internet thing. Um, but this early book of his did sort of set my own thinking, set me to thinking about male and female and, and uh, how fundamental this was to civilization. Uh, and it just sort of did determine my, my views of things after that. I did write two books about women in the military uh, while I was in the military or right after I was in the military. And, uh, and then I began also writing about the church teaching on uh, male and female. I wrote a book uh, years ago, published in 98, called The Scandal of Gender. Uh, which is surveyed early Christian teaching on male and female. Uh, the issue was, of course, all the more current seemed to be getting even more and more important as time went on with things, the way direction things are going. Uh, and I finally got around to, uh, to realizing that I needed to delve more into that, to do even more research into well, what the fathers taught about male and female, what scripture says, and what's come down to us. And I did end up doing my both my master's thesis and my doctoral um, dissertation on this issue of male and female, the master's thesis being specifically about deaconesses, deacons and deaconesses, and trying to explain both of them, and then the uh, doctoral thesis going to that more fundamental issue there, and just what, what it means to be made in the image of God and male and female, because that's what the first things we're told, really, about what it means to be human. In the image of God made he him, male and female made he them, 
And the church hasn't really had to explain that for a long time because it was sort of taken for granted. Everybody understood this is what we are. This is what it means to be human. You're a man or you're a woman. But in our own day, of course, people are questioning that. And they, they, they don't like what they're told by the church, by God himself, in terms of what they're supposed to be. And they're coming up with different ways of understanding it. Uh, unfortunately, even within the tradition, since, it, since Christians didn't, since they understood so much intuitively and accepted it, they didn't have to really explain it. And when they did sort of touch on it, you do get different voices there. This is what my doctoral dissertation or origins or revenge is about, is because there is sort of a, a there is a, a Greek influence on some thinking, very philosophical and very really anti-sexual. It's anti this distinction of male and female. It's all about the, the soul and the body and the soul trying to escape the body and the body being bad and sex being all about the body, really. Whereas you have much more the, the Hebrew tradition, which you find in scripture and, and many other fathers of the church, which does say, no, no, we're actually created to be men and women. And this is what we are always meant to be. And, uh, and only now are we being forced to sort of sort that out and to say, which of these traditions is really sounder? And I argue that, uh, that uh, of course, uh, really the, the consensus is on, on the side of those who believe that indeed we're meant to be men and women. And those are our choices. We're created that way by nature. And we're also expected to live accordingly, to live up that nature. So we have a, in Maximian terms for Maximus the Concessor is distinction of logos and tropos. We have a logos, which tells us that we're male or female. Every cell of our body is in fact coded as male or female. And then we have a, a tropos, which is the way we express that male and or femaleness. And that's a large part since we're free willing beings, it's a large part of how we choose to live. Um, we're not entirely free. We can live contrary to our logos, contrary to our nature, or we can live consistent with our nature. And, uh, and that's what the, the, the controversy today is all about. It's all about, should we be what God has actually created us, or are we free to just do whatever we want to be, be whatever we want to do, and change that whenever we want to change it? So, so that's the fundamental issue, as to what we are and, uh, and what that means. Well, there's a lot of people pushing all sorts of things that are contrary to our nature. So I'm thinking that uh, the people who have been uh, advocating for deaconesses for a long time are feeling inspired, you know, because there's all sorts of stuff with transgender ideology happening. But you see it like the fundamental issue as the natural and economic order of male and female, which you were just talking about. But one of the things that these uh, pro deaconess people um, say, and I've been reading their work, I was familiar with some of them, but I've really actually been reading their stuff. And it's all about subjection, that subjection is a stumbling block and that the church is actually um, oppressive toward women and that we have to get the subjection out of the way. What what do you um, say about this whole, first of all, subjection? What do you think they mean by it? And what does it really mean? And um, uh, how are they coming about it saying that um, there's actual oppression? And what I want to say, when we talk about they, you're probably going to mention Carrie Frederick Frost and her book, Church of Our Granddaughters. So we'll we'll get into her as well. But that's where I got some of my info from was reading um, some of her essays. Yeah, she makes it quite plain in her new book. And I've written a review of that in Rule of Faith uh, Journal and also on my blog. Um, her book is entitled Church of Our Granddaughters. Mm -hmm. And uh, my review is entitled Church of Whose Granddaughters. Mm -hmm. um, but but yeah, she does really re reveal herself. And, and, and we some of us have known Carrie for a while. And, and she was always sort of viewed as sort of a moderate on this issue. But in her book, it's quite plain that she's pretty thoroughly feminist. And yes, it's subjection. I mean, her book is basically an indictment of the church for not having treated women well all these years and uh, and being run by men. I mean, that's a constant theme in her book. It's, oh, it's men who are doing everything. And yet there is a natural order to things that uh, if you go back to scripture, you go to the fathers, this is just unquestioned. There's a way we're created. Uh, and then, and then, of course, there's also, of course, what God institutes after the fall and uh, the way we're created and God, the way God really means us to live is is different than the way that we're expected to live in the fall. But it's also consistent with it because uh, we're expected to live in the fall in certain ways that actually sort of should lead us back to the way we're meant to live. 
And it's not in that way. It's not where, well, there is if there is no difference between men and women. There is still a relationship, which I offer. And there's basis for this in scripture and also in the fathers that uh, actually the, the relationship between the man and the woman is actually sort of a way we bear the image of God. It's a way we parallel, we resemble God. You can draw an analogy, and St. Paul does more than once, between the man and the woman and God himself. Uh, 1 Corinthians 11, he talks about uh, the, the head of the woman is the man, and the head of the man is Christ, and the head of Christ is God. So you've got an analogy there between the father and the son and the man and the woman, and also between God and human beings. Uh, and then in first Ephesians 5, he does a similar thing. He draws an analogy between the man and the woman and Christ and the church. So there's an analogy between God and man again, man made in God's image there. And uh, what I explain in the uh, in dissertation and in a few other works as well is that uh, if you look at what he says in um, uh, uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 11, he talks about that head. He says the head, that word kephale there, in Greek, it actually was very rarely used to mean a ruling power. The Greek had, Greeks had a dozen words to mean the person in charge. You know, the king, the hegemon, the archon, lots of other words to, to, to designate the person who was sort of in charge and giving commands, you know, over others and whatnot. Lord, Kyrie, Kyrios, that's one. Um, a despota, another one we use, master. But, but the word kephale was rarely used in that way. It was instead often used to mean the source of something, the beginning of something. And we have that sense in English uh, with the words like headwaters um, uh, or the head of a river. Uh, and in fact, also in Hebrew, in the, the, the term Rosh Hashanah, it literally means the head of the year there, the beginning of the year there. And, and that's in a sense, what uh, uh, St. Paul is saying when he talks about the one being the head of the other, you have someone who's the source of another person. And the being the source of another person sort of says something about how those persons relate. Uh, one is the self-giving, gives of his being to the other, and the other responds with thanksgiving. And then that's, that's the difference we find between the Father and the Son. In the Gospels, in the Gospels, whenever it speaks about, especially in the Gospel of John, whenever it speaks about the Father and the Son, uh, and what they, how they relate to each other. You see that all the giving is done by the Father and all the thanking is done by the Son. Not once is it said that the Father give or thanks the Son and not once is it said that the Son gives anything to the Father except thanks. So that sort of defines their relationship. And, and that's the analogy that St. Paul uh, draw, uh, draws from that. Uh, and, and also uh, the, the, the use that other, some of the other fathers make about it. Uh, I was reading St. John, or, or actually St. Augustine just the other day, and I found a passage where he's talking about 1 Corinthians 11, and he's also identifying this as a matter of one person being the beginning of the other. And in English, that's the word used to translate the words he's using in Latin. Also, Theodore of Cyrus writes that, that indeed he actually uses Saint, uh, 1 Corinthians 11 to argue for the equality of the son with the father because the father is the source of the son. So, so that's it. There's a fundamental, in a sense, natural equality between the man and the woman in terms of one being the source of the other. And you only have to look at our DNA and you see that the man has both the X and the Y and the woman has the X. And so when God creates the woman, he just basically takes the X and he doubles it and he makes the woman. And, and in that sense, too, uh, every man really actually is the source of every woman because every person born gets, in a sense, its sex from the father rather than from the mother. They all get the X. Everybody gets an X, but only some get another X from the father and others get a Y from the father. And not to make too much of it, but, but it does parallel actually what we're told about the man being the source of the woman there. And so you have a fundamentally shared nature, shared equality. But then you have the fall. And in the fall, the concern on God's part is how to keep the man and the woman together and how to draw them back into this fundamental relationship that which is meant to be like his relationship, the father and the son of, of self-giving and thanksgiving. And, and the way uh, we, in the fall you have to do, since there's a, there are wills at, at odds with each other, you have to basically submit one to the other. And that's what he does. He submits the one, the woman to the man's care, the man's responsibility. The man is saddled with the responsibility for the woman. And of course, she gives up some freedom and independence for that. 
And in, in return, she gets that protection, that support, which enables her to fulfill the same role the man does for her own children there, because she will have children and then she will be the self-giving one and they will be the thanksgiving other there. So in a sense, we all, we all uh, are, are able to, in our lives, to uh, take these different roles, these Christ-like roles, because Christ is both. Towards the Father, he's thanksgiving. Towards us, he's self-giving. And we all are given opportunities to do that in our life, to be self-giving to others and thanksgiving to, the, to uh, you know, some. So it's, it's uh, the fundamental modes of relation that, that really do sort of help us understand male and female. But it does come with this understanding that indeed, yes, there is subjection there. There's, there's a degree of subjection. Uh, Saint uh, John Chrysostom says it's the, for the subjection is but slight on account of the fact that the, the, the two are committed in love, which is not the case with many other subjections. I mean, we're all subject to rulers. We're all subject to, uh, even in, in the church, we have superiors, we have masters. Um, and St. John Chrysostom does say that. He says, you know, from the beginning, uh, our, uh, God created one sovereignty only, that of the man over the woman. But after that, our race ran headlong into extreme disorder. He created other sovereignties, that of masters and governors. And this, too, for love's sake. He says, so it's all for our own good. It's all to keep us together, to restrain evil, to support us, to keep us from just going our way and disintegrating and not being able to maintain any kind of society with each other. Uh, we're bound together in this way. And it's uh, it's all because, of course, well, we live in the fall. We have different wills. And at some point, somebody has to sort of recognize another person as their lead in life and to go along with them. The ideal always being that we would have the same will, that we would all agree on things and and we would support one another, um, uh, but still with this idea that some people are responsible for giving to the other person, um, which I have to say, that's you know the, really what sets clergy apart from laity, is the laity have, clergy have a responsibility to give their lives for the parish, for the flock, for the people. And uh, the lady doesn't quite have that responsibility. They, they have that responsibility for other people for their families or for people that god brings their way but they don't have that responsibility for the whole parish or the whole church whereas the clergy does have that responsibility um and the same thing for for rulers and a christian idea a, a king lives for his people a prince a prince or you know any kind of president any kind of ruler would actually has a responsibility of giving of himself for the people that he's ruling over that's a christian understanding of really what life is about among persons Father, my dog is knocking out my door to be let out. I didn't realize she was in here. Give me two seconds and remind you where we were. Right. Ah. <laughs> okay. That was very, um, you know, professional. So here we go. Let's see if I can remember. Uh, so the complimented complementarian nature of Christianity. It's kind of Christianity 101. Um, I mean, I learned about this in Protestantism. You know, we uh, we all have different roles to play, but we are supposed to help each other. Like you said, it restrains evil. It can limit chaos, right? So, um, you know, and one thing I've learned about orthodoxy uh, over my last uh, six-ish years as being orthodox is orthodoxy is about balance. You know, it's about both the individual and the collective. It's about giving and taking, but being selfless, but also, you know, um, being self-interested in a way that, you know, you don't just walk off a bridge or whatever. You know, it's all these things. It's hierarchical and decentralized. It's personal and cultural. So to me, as a person, you know, coming into orthodoxy and seeing that this is being pushed like from a theological level, you know, with the transgender thing, it's science. They're remaking science and pretending real science doesn't exist and all these kinds of things. But, you know, it seems like this, uh, this Carrie gal is using theology and I'm not a theological expert, but it's it doesn't seem very honest what she's doing. So um, what do you think there's any theological basis for anything she says? Or is it kind of just um, cherry picking things to build an argument that she just already believes is true? And I guess 
the fact that you said that she used to be a moderate makes me trust her even less because um seems like she probably sees this as the fashionable thing to do it equals grants and money and book deals and um you know i just tell people if you want to tell the truth you're probably not going to rich get rich doing it so what do you make about all that just the theological arguments and then um i don't know what you know about this carrie gal yeah. not not that you have to slander that... her but you know what i mean just yeah. what she up to uh, well, I'll, I'll stick up for a little bit. I don't think she she doesn't have any ambition that she's trying to satisfy uh, other than a higher standing for women in general and maybe yourself. But but in in her position, although, of course, saying what she's saying would make it easier for her to hold jobs in a lot of universities. Uh, nevertheless, she's really saying it because she really does believe it. She really does feel that women have been poorly treated and uh, and that this is inconsistent, what she understands as Christianity. But she comes to that understanding by by indeed just sort of cherry, pick, cherry picking what um, she what what is for her uh, the Orthodox understanding. There was a uh, another feminist, not an Orthodox, named Daphne Hampson, who, who derided. She ultimately she was raised a Christian, but she ultimately she was such a feminist she realized that Christianity was just inconsistent with feminism. And, and she derided uh, feminists, Christian feminists, uh, for following the golden thread approach to hermeneutics, to interpreting the Bible. You, know, you pick out one verse and you make that your golden thread and you use that to judge everything else in the Bible. And uh, you know, for, for uh, some Protestant, for, for Luther, for instance, it's justification of my faith. Well, for a lot of feminists, it's uh, neither in Christ, there is neither male nor female. And they just use that as this, this is an absolute, uh, this is the basis of it all. Uh, and they disregard everything else in tradition, which in, which actually requires us to live as men and women. Even when we pray, you know, St. Paul teaches that women are to cover their heads when they pray. And of course, they're also supposed to dress like women and not dress like men. That's part of the, the law, Deuteronomy 22.5 there. So all along within the Old, New, Old Testament, New Testament, among the fathers throughout, we're always expected to live as men or women. And Carrie just ignores all of that entirely there. She just dismisses that as, uh, she doesn't even bother to dismiss it in a recent book. She just uh, acts as if, well, some people say this, but she doesn't provide any basis for it. She has no reference to scripture and the scriptural basis for this or the patristic basis for that matter. Uh, and instead she um, uh, makes more use of, as many of them do, um, the, the other version, you know, that, that golden thread, that denial of male and female, which you do find among those handful of fathers who followed the originist tradition, which is has its roots in Greek philosophy, which is very anti-male, um, which, which early on really takes the view that our salvation does indeed require us to throw off this business of male and female. Now, early on, what it meant was women becoming male, actually, because the female sex among the Greeks was seen as lesser than the male. And so for a woman to be saved, she had to be more manly. Um, but but ultimately, in, in Maximus Confessor, and actually I'd say also in St. Gregory of Nyssa, you do get this idea that part of actually becoming human uh, is to stop being a man or a woman, to throw off this distinction there. And yet we're required by tradition, by scripture, to practice being a man or a woman every day of our lives, even in prayer. And, and I argue, you just can't reconcile these two views. One is just plainly, in my view, wrong because it comes from a source outside the church. It comes from Greek philosophy with a heavy anti-sexual prejudice. Uh, and it, is, it just ignores and, uh, everything in scripture and tradition and in the fathers that would say that this is, you know, obviously this is actually something that God is, the way God has made us and this is the way we ought to live. Uh, and in the same way, I'd say is that problem with modern feminists is that they're not getting their feminism, you know, their their objection to subjection. They're not getting that from within the church. That's coming from outside the church. And it has deep roots in Western history, this rebellion against subjection. I mean, you see it even before the Reformation. 
you see it in the contention between uh, the, the Pope, Pope of Rome and the kings and emperor, the Holy Roman Emperor, and the kings of Europe. The contest between papalism and feudalism, which, which is all a fight over sovereignty, sovereignty. And that leads to this question of, well, just how sovereign is the Pope of Rome, which leads to the Reformation, where you have a rebellion against hierarchy, you know, the rule of priests. And then you then you which which in time leads to rebellion against kings, because, well, kings have to take side in this argument between the Protestants and Catholics. Uh, so, well, they come up with rationales for rebellion, of rebellion against monarchy, the rule of monarchs, kings. Uh, and then, of course, it leads in their own day to a rebellion against patriarchy, the rule of, of men, of fathers, of God the Father, ultimately. It does have, as Rachel, I think, uh, explained uh, in your interview with her a year or so ago, Rachel Wilson, that uh, this has deep roots in that kind of thinking, that this, uh, this post-Reformation, post-Enlightenment thinking, which is deeply resentful of the idea that one person would be subject to another person. That to them is a crime, a scandal. All subjection is tyranny. Um, uh, the thing to do is to throw it all off. I mean, this is what Rousseau is all about. This is what Marx is all about. Uh, so the apostles of that way of thinking, the real the originators, the source of uh, originators, the source of feminism are those Marxist Rousseauian theorists who just basically believe that, uh, well, it's just wrong that anybody should be subject to anybody else. And it's very extremely prideful. It's ultimately, in a sense, satanic. This is Luciferian. This is Satan, Satan's re rebellion against God there. You know, better to reign in hell than, or, than to, uh, what is it? Yeah, well, better to uh, uh, reign in hell than to serve in heaven, something like that. Uh, I've, I've mangled that a bit. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but, you know, it's basically the idea that you just don't want to submit to somebody else. And, and that's where this come from, you know. So so if I, you know, if our apostles are, that, you know, the, we, in a sense, the apostles for feminists are, are really Marx and Rousseau, not Peter and Paul. Right. If they're Peter and Paul, then we shouldn't we shouldn't think that Rousseau, subjection is nearly so bad. Uh, and it and it uh, and it can be, of course. But uh, the fact that some kings or some fathers, some husbands can be bad doesn't mean that we should have no kings or have no fathers or have no husbands. Um, there's, you know, the, the, there's a there's a good way of doing these things and a bad way of doing them, but uh, but still we need some order and uh, and there needs to be some determination as to you know how we're, we're to relate to each other and uh, all along we're all expected to practice humility and obedience. Mm -hmm. Christ Himself did. Christ Himself became obedient and uh, uh, and served the the Father uh, and He expects the same of us. We serve Him. Uh, our children should serve us. Um, th this is just a part of what it means to be a Christian, is to be humble, um, to, to serve others, and to also give of yourselves for other, to others as, as someone that, that others might serve also. Yeah, and one um, there's a couple of points. Origin is considered a heretic, so basing, am I correct? <laughs> yes, yes. Right. Oh, yeah. So basing anything on something he said would already you know that already is Suspect. a red flag for me right yeah, so yeah. and then of course this in this enlightenment value and it's actually extremely libertarian as in you know every man is an is is his own island and you know society is you know um you know a force for evil because you know it's always pushing upon you because oh wow you actually have to consider other people who live around you it's actually like the extreme um nth degree of libertarianism and obviously you cannot live by yourself um that is just not something right. atomized people are not just lonely and sad but also it's just not realistic so again it's like people pushing against reality when um it's just smacking you right in the face. And then if the feminists were doing well, like if feminism had come to, to the fore as it has and everything was going swimmingly, they may have a point. But everybody with a, a, an honest eye can see that it has been a train wreck. It has been a force for evil against the family, against male relationships with females and vice versa, against mother and child. It has not been a force for good. So to 
be pushing that <laughs> at this late hour, I mean, I think is ludicrous. So um, I minored in women's studies back in the 90s. So I was taught all this nonsense, but I still never thought, even though I was kind of taught to be a man hater, I never really was. Like I had tons of guy friends and, you know, knew that we all had to kind of live together to figure this thing out. So um, I find it strange, but the golden thread lady, what was her name? Uh, Daphne Hampson. All right. So I poked around on her because you had mentioned her in one of your articles. And the one thing with her would be she left Christianity, correct? Right. Yes. Okay. Yes. Give it up. There's an honest person. Honest like, woman. <laughs> I don't like what you're doing. I don't like what you're selling. So I'm out of here. See, and that's yeah. what I don't get about this. So when I first heard about this in 2016, 2017, I just thought, they're feminists and orthodoxy. I was completely naive and clueless. I mean, I just had no idea that was even a thing in orthodoxy. And my first response is, well, why are they orthodox? So that would be my question to these people. Go do, well, it would be a statement, go do something else. And why the heck are you orthodox? And I would think it's because they're subversives, but what do you think? Well, you know, a lot of them have just been raised wrongly. They've been catechized poorly. Um, uh, and there are deep roots to that. Uh, yeah, you know, the, the uh, orthodoxy survived at, in a sense, almost the lowest level. I mean, well, it had it had a lot of good in it still, but but uh, in the modern world, people were quite taken, especially immigrants coming to the West. They were simply quite taken with Western ways, modern Western ways. And they also tended if they were coming from the Middle East. A lot of times they would associate the older ways, which are actually Christian, with Islam because, well, you know, Muslims, their women have to cover their heads. Mm -hmm. Their women are subject and whatnot. And so they always sort of uh, saw the Muslims and, and actually Arabs have always been more extreme in that regard. Tertullian in the second century writes about how extreme the Arabs are when it comes to covering their women. So Arabs have always been that way. But a lot of uh, Europeans... Uh, in the modern age, having had that experience would associate that kind of subjection, that kind of treatment of women with Islam, and they would see that in the worst possible way. And then they come to the West, and of course, you know, here it's a, just a, the rules are all different. And, and rules are going to be different. How we respect the difference of male and female will vary from time and place. Um, there are just different ways of doing it. Uh, even in my own my own experience there, you know, my mother and my father relate to each other a little differently than my wife and I do. You know, I actually do cooking. I uh, sometimes I do dishes. I do a lot that my father never had to do. And uh, and that's just sort of part of uh, societal expectations there. Um, but the thing is, you can you can raise people to expect certain things and they will see then nothing wrong with it once they're raised that way. Unfortunately, we, we have generations now of, of women and men who've been raised in the most modern ways uh, that, that aren't really uh, traditional at all. And, and they bought, the, they bought the, the, just the modern rationale about subjection. You know, it's part of our, our, our Americanism, really. really. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm an American. I, my deep roots here, my ancestors fought for the revolution. And uh, and I'm deeply sympathetic, actually, to the you know the conservative libertarians there. I like limited government. I wish we had less government. I wish we were freer, actually, to live our lives. But but I, I as an Orthodox as a Christian, I've never really bought the uh, a lot of the arguments that Americans have used to justify that kind of freedom um, because they weren't well found founded. Um, I did write another book about uh, called Eight Ways to Run the Country, which has been used to teach politics, actually, at Yale. And what I do is, is I uh, look at the different ways in which the early fathers, part of it is uh, different ways they justified their own revolution. And they were just reaching in all different directions for justifications for rebellion, really. And, and although they had, a, you know, some of, those, some of those claims were good, others were actually uh, just, well, they didn't, they didn't fit with each other. For instance, yes, the, you had people claiming individual rights, but also traditional rights. Well, the traditional rights were more familial and communal. The individual rights were all about the individual. And that's another thing entirely because there are threats to each other, these things. And then of course, the whole idea of democracy and the rule of the people, what people can do what they want. Well, that's a threat to both natural rights and 
traditional rights there. So, you know, the arguments didn't really uh, uh, match up. And a lot of them were, in fact, inspired by this uh, revolutionary or anarchical spirit that arose out of the Reformation, uh, which, which ultimately does lead to a revolution, uh, both the American Revolution, the French Revolution, you get a much fuller, plainer expression of that. And then, of course, the Russian Revolution and all the revolutions in between, the Revolution of 1848 there. Um, it's, it's, it, in, in a sense, that's, that's what uh, a lot of it is about shaking off Christianity. Uh, that's what happened in the French Revolution. Actually, it happened in our revolution, too. So after our revolution, a lot of states disestablished their churches uh, and, and wrote essentially, well, you know, atheistic constitutions that, that really provide no, no endorsement of God, really. Um, maybe some freedom, but even that's, that's now being challenged. Uh, so I, I'm sympathetic to uh, many of the claims for a need for limited government, uh, but but also recognizing that a lot of these ideas come from well outside the church, out of the Western experience, which is compromised very early on by its own contentions long ago. And, uh, and orthodoxy for me was actually uh, a breath of fresh air. It was something that made much more sense mm -hmm. in terms of looking at uh, the orthodox history. Uh, not that they had all the freedom in the world, but nevertheless, their 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 political and legal theory, which far more consistent, made much more practical sense than do our own ideas of what is right and wrong here. Uh, yes, we'd all like to be free. But sometimes we actually don't deserve that freedom. And at the same time, uh, we can't always trust governments to. We do right. need to recognize it's a fallen world. Things are not as we would like them. Uh, and sometimes we just have to suffer um, certain things and do what we can to to uh, do the best we can. Um, but anyway, that's all behind. I think that all feeds into the, the, the modern feminist mindset. They're just going with the world. Uh, and many of them are so committed to it that they just they just they can't see things any other way. It'd be a shock to their lives. It would be just make their lives very difficult nowadays. Um, because it is, for an academic, it's very difficult to find a job on any college campus uh, holding traditional views. Um, it's just not welcome, especially in religion departments. There's a whole movement out there for uh, public religion, um, you know, religion that is safe, uh, that doesn't uh, disturb things, that does actually supports the secular world we live in. Uh, there's, there's money for that. There are positions. There's tenure for that. There's not tenure. There's none of those rewards for somebody who's going to be arguing a, a more traditional view of things, especially one that uh, is, would point the fingers at other religions and saying, well, you know, there's a lot lacking in those or or that's going to be advocating, of course, different roles for men and women. Um, it's just not welcome at all. So that's a part of it, although largely you know, a lot of true believers on, on yeah. the, among the feminists. So. Yeah, and you know, you brought up Rousseau and Marx, you know, they battled against subjection, <clears throat> supposedly, but it was just a power play, so they could have all the power, yep. and that's yep. exactly what I see this as, yep. so you have people like Carrie, is that her name, Carrie? Carrie, um, yeah. yeah. Carrie, um, you know, saying, we have to do this for women, I mean, that sounds just like any politician saying, you know, you have to raise taxes for the, the school children, you know, so the administrators at the public school can make more money, you know, you have to do this big revolutionary change because it's going to help people. I mean, at this point, I, you know, I just see that as clear as day that it is. Um, it's a power play, I think, because I don't think it's about, <laughs> um, you know, being kind to women at all. I see it as pushing something equality in the American uh, way uh, as in not a good thing. So I've written a lot against egalitarianism because that is really that's the way people see equality. It's not, you know, people being kind to each other and, you know, having equal opportunity or things like that, but it, it's, it's about leveling the playing field through destruction. So, right. I mean, that, that's what this means to me. And then when I poke around on some of these people that work at the, the St. Phoebe center um, for deaconesses, whatever it's called, it's, um, you know, you just have to poke around on them a little bit. And then I think it's abundantly clear that there is a revolutionary spirit with these people who they want to completely not right. restore. I think they want to renovate and change. 
you know, so they keep talking about restoration and you can talk about that a little bit because the history is not what we think it is. So that's going to be one of my questions. But the second is um, it's, I think about just total renovation. Um, yeah. So what do, what do you think the, the history aspect of it, you know, it's that there were never deaconesses across the board, which is kind of what I thought, oh, it was something that was practiced and then there was no need for that and they got rid of it. Tell a little bit about the history and why their history is faulty. Yeah, they, you know, uh, you, you start with, we, we, we have to understand that history is not tradition. History only becomes tradition when it is handed down. And in fact, the deaconesses have not been handed down to us. Uh, they did exist long ago, but the church decided we don't need these anymore. Uh, and, and maybe we shouldn't have these anymore. And they did stop making women deaconesses. And that's actually been the tradition for the past thousand years, really. And, and in, even in the early centuries, deaconesses did not exist everywhere. They were very much resisted in the West. And there are good reasons for that. Um, and, uh, and, and what deaconesses were, even where they did exist in the East, is not what the advocates of deaconesses today want. None of them want that kind of deaconess, that kind of female deaconate, with all of its limits. Uh, back then, you had to be at least 40 to be a deaconess. And actually, sometimes the rule was 50, and sometimes the rule was 65. Uh, it it uh, So you were already at menopause or approaching menopause, and you had to be celibate. You had to be without a family, without a husband, um, and you had to submit yourself to the, uh, of course, the rule of uh, that all other clergy, you know, become obedient to uh, your bishop and do what your bishop said. And the, the rule or the, the duties of a deaconess were actually very limited. Uh, they principally were there to assist in baptism because baptism was done nude or nearly nude, and there was some concern about protecting the modesty of the women. And so the, the a deaconess, or if there weren't a deaconess, it would be a pious woman, maybe a widow, um, would perform the anointing. The, the priest would say the prayer, and then the, a woman would actually do the anointing there. Mm. So that was their principal task. And we that's, that's what's first given as a reason for having deaconesses. Uh, they also at times uh, took uh, Holy Communion to women who were shut-ins, because in those days, of course, women didn't go to church at certain times. They were, we even today, of course, you know, a woman doesn't come to church right after um, childbirth. She's given time to recover, to spend with the child, to to get back into the routine of things before she has to come to church. And uh, but in in old days, if this happened during um, um, uh, the Pascha they would have someone, because everybody wanted to commune at Pascha, they would have someone take uh, the body and blood to a person in their own homes. And in some parts of the world, a man couldn't do that. A man wouldn't go to the home of a woman and, uh, and meet with her privately. That was considered inappropriate. And so they would have deaconesses do that and trust deaconesses to take the body and blood. Uh, and also in, in monasteries where there were deaconesses, the deaconess would be in charge of communing people when outside of a divine liturgy, if someone were sick uh, and um, or near death and needed to be communed, a deaconess in a monastery could do that. Uh, and it did uh, sort of become associated with monasteries there. It's largely a monastic rite. And that's that's sort of what the the, the surviving uh, right of ordination for deacon is sort of reflects that. It's a monastic right. It was also an honor given to aristocratic women um, for a couple of reasons. One is thanks uh, for their support for the church and recognition of their service to the church. Uh, you have uh, people like uh, St. Olympias, a friend of St. John Chrysostom uh, in the late fourth century there, a young widow, uh, very wealthy, who founded hospitals and uh, orphanages and did a lot for the church and so was made a deaconess at an early age. And that was one of the reasons why they set the age higher because, uh, well, you know, the emperor didn't like the fact that we had this young woman who could have married somebody else at court. Um, and, uh, and yet she was made a deaconess and therefore she could not marry. And, um, but, uh, but she was uh, an aristocratic woman who, uh, uh, who was brought into the church, could do a lot for the church. Um, there is one feminist scholar, modern feminist scholar, uh, uh, who I think makes a very good case that sometimes, you know, an aristocratic woman, aristocratic women, wealthy women, 
could be actually uh, very difficult. They could make trouble for bishops. They could, uh, you know, want their way. And one way of bringing them uh, uh, under control was to Shocker. make them a deaconess. <laughs> yeah. So you make them a deaconess. Oh, and then you have to obey the way a deacon does and a priest does. So um, and I think that's part of, of what uh, was going on there. They were honoring women for their service <clears throat> and at the same time bringing them under control. Uh, and it was also used as a consolation for uh, women whose husbands were selected to be bishops. Um, you know, the, the requirement uh, later be eventually became that a bishop would be celibate, he'd be a monk, uh, and therefore if they selected a man who was married, well, um, there had to be a separation there. And so what they would do is they'd make the man a bishop and make the woman a deaconess, and she'd go away to a monastery there. And for pious couples, that was considered a great honor, a great way to end your life, you know, go on to the next stage of life and doing that. So that's what deaconesses were. And they lingered mainly in the East and mainly in the major cities in Constantinople. It's probably the last place they had deaconesses. Uh, they were never very common, even in the East, uh, but there's almost no record, of, no real historical record of them in Egypt uh, or in the West for centuries, for a long, long time. And in fact, there, there were Western councils that forbade the, uh, the, the making of deaconesses. Uh, even in the late fourth century, even at the time of uh, St. Olympias, when deacons were common uh, in the East, and the capital, Constantinople, uh, where she was, um, the Westerners didn't know that they were deaconesses in the East. They still thought, oh, this is something that only heretics have there. And, um, and that, that uh, and the, and the one reason there shows you in a sense that the West had no tradition of deaconesses. Their, their translations into Latin of uh, St. Paul's epistle to the Romans, the last chapter, yeah, he mentions St. Phoebe. St. Phoebe has has done a lot for the church, and he uses the term diakonos when he's referring to her. Well, and that's where we get deacon, uh, but it meant a trusted servant, and in that day, it meant a trusted servant in a lot of different ways. Uh, there are half a dozen men in the New Testament referred to as diakonos, including Christ and St. John the Baptist and St. Paul himself and a number of others. Uh, the, the, the men who served the wine at the wedding of Canaan were called diakonoi. You know, the, the plural, diakonos, servants. Rulers were also called servants of God, diakonos of God there. So it, it was quite a common term to mean a trusted servant. Even, even when the, the apostles in Acts chapter 6 go around, go about, or come, come to appointing the first deacons, the seven men, they make deacons, uh, they give them the task of, of daily ministration, which is daily diakonia. But even that passage makes reference to the diaconia of the word, which is the apostle's responsibility. So everybody, in a sense, was a diaconos, in a sense. Hmm. And so it's hard to say for sure that Phoebe held a particular office that later came to be associated with the word. Certainly, that's what many people assumed in the East, because they're reading the word after, the, after they've come to understand this is an office in the church. They're reading the word differently, and they're, they're assuming that this means she had an ordained office. But in the West, they had no such tradition. The West always translated that word diakonos as a, a ministra, which meant simply trusted servant, minister, um, but without, a, a, without specific reference to an, an office in the church. Because in the other passages where it talked about deacon or bishops and deacons, uh, there it used diakonos in Latin, just transliterated it. So the, so the Latin West had both the word diakonos, uh, which they used for the office in the church, and those were all men. Uh, and then for all other usage, they used the word minister or ministra, which just meant a servant. Um, and that's one of, the, one of the ambiguities there, which make it not quite so clear whether there were deaconesses at the, at the beginning. There are certainly women who served the church in trusted capacities like St. Phoebe, and, and probably were very helpful, very uh, influential, uh, nevertheless, didn't have the duties or the authority or the honors that came to be associated with the office of male deacon there. That's something that did evolve over time. By the end of the first century, you get this order of bishop, priest, and deacon. <clears throat> and the deacon's job was actually as the executive assistant to the bishop. Um, the priest didn't rate deacons, uh, and that's why you know, we think deacons just sort of disappeared uh, because we have parishes with priests but no deacons, uh, but that's because deacons always belong to bishops. 
uh, and they were uh, they were used as somebody in authority so that the bishop could focus on spiritual matters and not have to be the one to decide, for instance, who got what out of the church treasury, which is what they were originally charged to do. They had that authority. And uh, that's what the, the apostles didn't want to, uh, to, to involve themselves in, that business of taking in money and then laying it out for other people. Right. Uh, deaconesses in the early centuries were uh, had a, a surprising authority over the finances of the church or the organization, the discipline of the church. Um, they were really the, the right-hand man of a bishop um, acting his capacity in a lot of ways. And in fact, priests were often jealous of deacons. Uh, and it was sometimes considered a demotion to a deacon to make him a priest because you took away his power, you know, his authority, and then you made him, gave him just the responsibility for a few souls over here in this parish. Hmm. I mean, that was considered a demotion. You know, no longer was he in the cathedral running things. He was in some little parish in a far part of the city or in another town and just caring for souls there. Um, that was there. There a lot of evidence that that was considered a demotion. It did sometimes happen. So it, it's it's not what we think of as as uh, today as a deacon. Then it was clearly a, a an executive capacity, uh, which means that well, you know, uh, if that's your understanding of deacon, well, how can a woman be a deaconess? How can she be a deacon? Because they did use the terms interchangeably. Diaconisa only occurs first occurs for the first time in the first ecumenical council in three twenty five. Um, but before that and after that, they still sometimes simply call them diaconos, uh, using the, the feminine article for it, female deacon, basically. And, um, and, yet, and yet they didn't have the standing of male deacons. Uh, they were distinguished from male deacons in almost every way, except for that term. And I, and I actually mentioned in my book on deaconesses is that, you know, the order might have survived had they not been called deacons or deaconesses. If they'd had another name, the church might have preserved it because it would not have seemed to put women over men in the hierarchy of their church, which is what the name diaconos did. It's because they had the name diaconos, it made it sound like they were above men in the church. And that was just not consistent with the order of nature, the order of the church. Right. Um, you know, women just weren't expected to be able to have authority over men. And uh, and there there may have been abuses. We don't have any record of them, but that may have been a reason why, indeed, the church fathers did decide after a while we'll just not have any of these anymore. So, yeah. Uh, so the the pro deaconess people talk about overcoming patriarchal religion when we are you know a faith that has patriarchs. You know we have church fathers. We also have you know, church mothers. And we obviously have um, a lot of women who have played a role in the church, most specifically the Theotokos. Um, but it's just interesting to me because it's like the women were already doing these great things. They didn't need a title, you know? I mean, some of them were given it as a tool to, you know, for, for I don't know, managerial reasons, but um, women we're already doing these things just like they are right now doing these things, helping people. Right. We just don't need a title. It's strange to me. It's almost like a very um, modern woman, like workforce kind of thing. And people who have PhDs behind their names, sorry, father, often are like this, that if you don't have those letters, you yeah. just can't participate in the conversation. You have no clue because you haven't gone to XYZ university or done a dissertation yeah. or whatever. You know, sometimes I think those people who haven't done all those things, sometimes they're smarter, but you know, I mean, <laughs> these things are already happening. Women are helping women. <laughs> women are helping yeah. men. We're, we're helping each other. We don't need somebody to give us permission to do it because that's our calling as Christians. So, um, yeah you know what what do you think about that that it's just um well <laughs> it's a it's a it's a common human temptation to to want to have the rank the status in that mm -hmm. and uh um and uh, in my own case i got the phd because just for what you say is because <laughs> no it helps to have those those letters after your name then sometimes people will pay attention to you not all the time but sometimes they will and i was already writing things uh, that that I was having a hard time getting published because I didn't have the letters. Uh, I find it a lot easier now that I do. People will actually publish my articles and my books a lot more readily. Uh, so they do matter in a practical sense. 
Um, but for a lot of people, yes, it's it's something they aspire to. And and unfortunately, this is well, it's true of a lot of men too. Um, uh, th there is there is righteous ambition there. St. Paul speaks of this. You know, it's 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 right to aspire to do uh, greater things. Um, but uh, a, a lot of what uh, you you end up learning when you when you are ordained is how humbling it is, and um, uh, and and how you don't almost ever really measure up to what you might expect. Um, um, so you, you you I'm sure a lot of men come in it uh, come at or seek organi uh, ordination because indeed they want to be the man in charge. Um, and, uh, and in a way that's consistent with partly with what it is to be a man too. Uh, it is, it is a part of our calling. It is our, our responsibility and it is a manly thing to do in a church that does reserve leadership for men there. So it's only natural, but yes, there is the selfish part of us, the ego, the ego, uh, that, that wants to be, um, you know, wants to have that rank. Um, what you learn, I, I think all good men learn is that it's actually is a role of self-giving like Christ uh, with plenty of opportunity to be humbled by how you fail at that and, and how dissatisfied people may be with you. Because I'm, every parish priest has heard the worst thing said about him from his own parishioners, I'm sure. Um, you know, you, you dissatisfy a lot of people. There's a lot of opportunity to actually learn um, just how little you're able to do sometimes. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, so it's a learning process, but, but it is a calling. It is something that has to be done. Uh, there are other roles for women. There are you know, a lot of things that women do, have always done. And we, you know, civilization couldn't survive without them. Uh, the St. Paul says, and he talks about, um, um, well, the salvation of the woman, she can be saved through childbearing, because what is that but self-giving, giving of your life for other people, uh, raising saints for the church. Um, and, you know, we, we, we raise our boys so that they'll uh, become uh, uh, the heads of families and parishes, and we raise our girls so that they can raise more saints. Um, because that's absolutely necessary. And our world is largely falling apart because that has not been done. So many people in our society today simply have not had a healthy upbringing uh, and they do not have, know how to control their own passions uh, and uh, or how to respect others. Do not look and think in terms of giving of themselves for others or humbling themselves before others. Uh, and that leads to all the illnesses we have today, the riots, the road rage, uh, at the selfishness, the, the, the litigiousness, the suing constantly of other people. And uh, all, the, all our ills are a result of, in the sense of a, a failure of child rearing by men and women, husbands, fathers and mothers and that. Um, a lot comes from that. And a lot of it though is of course backed by wrong ideas, wrong ideas from long ago that we've been listening to far too long right. uh, because we've been assuming that what the world tells us is actually true when so much of the time it's actually quite false actually it's interesting too because um a, a lot of this ilk that pushes the feminist ideas you know they're also wanting to get rid of anti-semitic language and hymns at pasca in fact uh carrie frost talks about that in an article that i'm going to link on the show notes page she just casually drops that in there like oh we're going to do that too um you know it, it's it's all about changing something that was never a tradition and this th this ilk of people that want to come in and change the church and see it as not the hospital but they see it as something that is has been harmful to people um i, I find that strange she uses some very strong language to um i don't know if she uses the word harm but she's saying that the church is in error and it has been for a very very long time so yeah. the hubris of that kind of blows me away, but um, I don't know. It's um, it, it's it's strange to me because I, I I don't know. It's they want to transform everything, and they're using history and tradition, the things that they go after people like me and others that are really wanting to keep tradition alive to find out what it was because what we're doing now in the world around us isn't working. And so tradition is the key. They, they, they're actually co-opting that, you know, 
but the rest of us can't use tr history and tradition because we're going to tell you exactly what it means right. when they're cherry picking and it's false. But yeah, they're throwing kind of the, um, I mean, I think Carrie's kind of throwing a, a lot of things, you know, in, in with this, the anti-Semitic stuff. Um, I, you know, I'm sure there's some kind of like anti-racism stuff she wants to do too. Um, she's a member of Axia Women and I've poked around oh, on them. Yeah. Those are not, um, they're all feminists. I mean, they're all yeah. ardent feminists. <laughs> um, yeah. So, you know, I don't know what they want us to do with this other than go, okay, well, you've made your point very clear over here. We're going to do the opposite of what y'all say. Yeah. I don't know. Why is it getting traction? Is it getting traction just because we're talking about it? Well, they're pushing, um, you know, and it's, and of course the, the other side, you know, all these things go hand in hand, uh, the feminism, um, a, a lot of the other views, as you mentioned, the you know the the the, the, the civic issues, of the view of the war. You know, by and large, these people are very anti-Russian at this point. Russians are traditional, and Russians aren't doing what Americans want them to do. They're not with the West. Well, you know that these feminists are are part and parcel of the West, the modern West, mm -hmm. and they see the world that way. They trust Western society, they trust Western government, they trust Western media. Uh, their values are essentially modern secular values, which they've gotten from secular sources. They're oftentimes very plainly anti-Christian sources there. If you go back far enough, you're talking about really radical people who introduced these ideas to our thinking there. And, and yet they somehow become sort of uh, homogenized or, or, or sanctified by the fact that other people pick them up who are not that bad. Uh, but, but clearly you can start with, if you just wanted to start with the Communist Manifesto, they were talking in many cases about a lot of things that we're doing now, the destruction of the family. That's part of the Communist Manifesto there. So early on, and of course, free love, oh, that's a hundred years old or more. Uh, all of these things have been around for a while, but they start out in far corners of people who really hate Christianity, uh, and then they get ultimately sort of, you know, introduced among Christians, and then embraced by kinds of Christians there that, that are all a part of that civilization, all a part of that mindset, very trusting of the world, very resentful of anybody who would try to uh, preserve anything that's not what the world's all about. Uh, who would make life difficult by requiring people to live differently um, because, well, ultimately comes down to a cross of Christ. Uh, you know, are you going to stand for what is true and good and always has been that way and lose your job um, or you just lose friends? Uh, that's oftentimes what it means to, to bear witness to the truth, to, to maintain traditional ways, to advocate for the truth, to stand against all of these modern ideas. Uh, and the problem that uh, uh, truly moderate, moderate feminists like Carrie face is that uh, their sexual allies are so extreme, you know, now not only into in advocating homosexuality, but also transgenderism. And of course, after that, well, they're going to eventually get to pedophilia. It will be there. It's already there in certain corners. Um, uh, eventually, that'll be part of the mix, too, because it all fits. Uh, but for people like Carrie, it's like there. That, that's why she, in a sense, likes to think of herself as in the middle, um, because she's not nearly as extreme as the, um, you know, some of the gay activists or the transgender activists. Uh, nevertheless, uh, that's that that's the, the the people she's really among, because a lot of these other advocates of uh, deaconesses are, in fact, in favor of that view of things, and they're very active. They're very well funded. Um, they're getting funding from a lot of sources outside the church, uh, some inside the church. Um, and uh, a lot of them just think, well, this is just the, the way things are going. Um, and they know that if they just keep pressing, keep pushing, that eventually, yes, a, a lot of people will cave in. Uh, I, I think they're a bit surprised that there's a little more resistance than they would have expected at this point. Um, right. you know, we're, we are putting up a fight. And actually, and that's what I think is so encouraging is that is that they, they're, you know, Lenin was noted as saying as a revolutionary, the Bolshevik, uh, the worse things get, the better things are. It's actually sometimes attributed to Trotsky. Could be either. Any Bolshevik could have said that. You make enough disorder and we can take advantage of that and create right. our own order there. Well, you know, 
<clears throat> we might not be able to say today that the worse things get, the better things are, but we can say the worse things get, the clearer things are. Right. Because it's becoming quite clear or, or where a lot of these wrong ideas lead and the right. disaster they make in people's lives and in countries and in civilizations. And it's become so absurd that lots more people are waking up and realizing there's got to be a better way. There's, right. you know, we, we just can't can't continue down the same road there. Um, and that's where I know that the advocates of deaconesses, they, they, they've got, they've got support. They think they're ready. The, you know, they, the ecumenical patriarch in publishing their social eth ethos document a couple of years ago, uh, basically endorsed deaconesses, other things as well, wider role for women and whatnot. Um, and so they feel time is on their side. And it certainly is in the sense that yes, a, a large part of the church, largely the Greek church, uh, under the ecumenical patriarch and then the Greek archdiocese and, and other Greeks in, in Athens, also in Greece and uh, other parts of jurisdiction, other jurisdictions too. They are very much taken, very much part of the modern world and they're gonna go with the modern world. And uh, I do believe, you know, we're now in schism with uh, that part of the Orthodox church. And uh, I, I believe like a lot of people, this is this schism will be, will be permanent. Uh, that that there will be a final, ultimately complete break between uh, this modern or postmodern, this pro-gay, pro-feminist, uh, pro-West, uh, secular, essentially secular orthodoxy, which is just sort of an orthodox Eastern Rite Episcopalianism, really, that's what it comes down to, uh, and those who still hold to ancient teachings. Um, uh, the, those denominations are thriving. We're growing. I've got, I, I teach catechism at the cathedral. I, I, I hold about four classes a year. Classes run like 14 weeks, uh, two hours every week. Um, and, 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 and I don't have any trouble getting people for the classes. The current class I have is nine people, uh, 10 sometimes when, when one of them brings his, his girlfriend. But uh, in the class before that, I had seven people. Um, and before that was six, um, they, we're, it, we're just getting more and more people as time goes on with people being able to find out uh, alternative ideas and realize that because of work like yours and, um, and others online, uh, they can go online, they can find better answers. And then all they have to do is visit an Orthodox church uh, and we can sit down with them mm -hmm. and we can explain things to them in ways they, they, you know, they've not heard elsewhere. Um, and they're just in awe because they come to an Orthodox church, a traditional one, and they see the beauty mm -hmm. and the seriousness, the, the deep faith, and, and of just plain good sense and the answers they're given for things. Um, it's just, it's amazing. Uh, you know, we're not advertising, we're not doing anything different, but people are coming to us because things are getting so bad and people can see it. And yeah, authentic, it's great. great time authentic, to be alive. Authentic, traditional, unchanged, right? Um, and th that's one of the reasons there's such a pushback against the converts. You know, that's like now the new insult in the orthosphere is that you're a convert is because many people like me, tons of people coming to this churches that you're speaking of, the ones that are growing, <coughs> come from Protestantism and they've seen, I'm going to name drop here, Orthodox people and I might not know them, Beth Moore, what she's done to it. Jesus and John Wayne was a book written by Kristen Cobes Dumez. It's an insane book that has driven people away from Protestantism. You know, you've got Jen Hatmaker, all these women who wrote these books and they started like preaching on their own and then, you know, making their way into different uh, various uh, branches of Protestantism. And it ruined it, you know, so it's not that we're coming to orthodoxy because we're just leaving something, but we're just looking for authentic truth. And we just saw that Protestantism wasn't answering those questions and it was not putting up any barriers to the Jesus and John Wayne books of the world, you know, so people come in and then they want to warn other people and say, okay, you know, if you give them an inch, they're going to take a mile. All you have to do is look at, you know, the world around you. This is not an exercise in our imaginations. It happens everywhere. If you give the subversives a tiny bit, they're going to take over. Oh, Sullivan's Law, you've probably heard of that before in politics. You know, any um, entity that isn't like, I think he uses the word right wing, but the stringently right wing will be left wing in like two days. I mean, you don't have to use those terms, but anything that 
ardently unchanging traditional and unapologetically and not afraid to be called names will not be that if you crack the veneer. So oh, yeah. um, anyway, that's why these churches are growing, you know? And so uh, what do you think about the, the the pushback to the traditionalists or people um, in the orthosphere or good priests and proto deacons who are standing up against this? Because I don't think there are enough clergy standing up against this, you know, maybe they're just letting us in the orthosphere fight the battles, but I was so thankful when you reached out to me and I poked around on you. I was like, who is this guy? And I was like, oh, he's legit. He's not a subversive. So why are more clergy not speaking out against this or are they? And I'm just missing it. Well, clergy, of course, most of them are priests and, and they have parish responsibilities and, and they're caring for souls and, and they may not see a lot of these problems, actually. I mean, depending upon what jurisdiction you're in, you, you might actually be in a fairly sane parish in which it's enough. It's enough to fill the day to actually care for their souls in many other ways there. So so they may not actually just uh, simply, in a sense, have a calling uh, because of an obvious need or an obvious something that they can do in order to sort of get out there and advocate these things. Uh, and some of us do, you know, some of us, well, uh, for whatever reason, uh, our lives have happened in such a way that we do feel called to speak out on them. They are difficult uh, topics, um, particularly in a, in a sense, you'd think that it's so plain in terms of what the church has always taught about male and female. And it's becoming more obvious how di different that is from what, of course, the modern world wants. Um, but when you come to the theological issue, mm -hmm. that has been rather difficult and that has never really been explained adequately. And this is what I hope I've done in my book, Origins for Revenge, because I have offered a way of understanding these things that does provide a, a, a better, sounder, uh, patristic, apostolic, scriptural basis for uh, the traditional understanding of male and female, which, which sees great value in it, indeed sees male and female being a man and being a woman as part of the way in which we bear the image of God. The way they relate is the way the father and the son relate. To a certain degree. And, and this is what has always been missing. We haven't needed it until now, but now we need a good, sound, theological understanding of male and female. And I hope I've given it. I've mm -hmm. certainly a, attempted to do that. And, and so far, I've not come across anybody who's been able to contradict it in any significant way. Uh, what people will do is they'll complain, oh, you've said bad things about St. Maximus the Confessor or St. Gregor the Nyssa. Yeah, I think they were wrong. I think they were wrong about this. I think they were borrowing a sort of standard pagan Greek to understand, philosophical Greek understanding of things and not being faithful to the tradition to the degree that they 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 could have. And, and, and just, uh, although not defying the tradition, Nevertheless, not respecting parts of it in ways that are necessary now, and and hopefully maybe in the future we'll see more uh, as as what I've offered uh, is looked at more often. Uh, they'll see that this does make sense. It makes it easier to explain. If you talk about the natural relationship of the man and the woman, it's a matter of self giving and thanksgiving, just as just what we see between the father and the son. Uh, it puts it on that level. This is how the man and woman are supposed to relate in that kind of way. Uh, the same way that priests relate to their people. That's also self-giving and thanksgiving. With the way princes and their people, their nations relate, that's in a Christian uh, Christian understanding. That's how they should relate. Uh, also, of course, between parents and children. Uh, that's also self-giving, thanksgiving. This makes sense. And that's the natural way. But yes, there is in the fallen world because of our conflicting wills, our disagreement on things, it does need to be some order and some subjection. And that's where, yeah, that does come in. But it is based upon the love that, that uh, husbands and wives feel for each other. Um, you know, C.S. Lewis, I know, and I think is absolutely true, is that, uh, you know, the, greater, the, great, the, 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 the greatest danger is, is not that men will be tyrants, but that they will be cowards that they will be henpegged to the point of just going along with the women. And that's the story of Adam and Eve, basically. Mm -hmm. Adam fails in his responsibility to actually lead Eve away from the serpent. And so she falls and then he follows her. So they, they both, in a sense, turn away from their, I use the term archic for archae, mm -hmm. which means beginning, 
it's, it's actually a synonym for kephale in the scriptures. They, they use those terms interchangeably, RK for beginning and kephale for head, meaning beginning. Um, and they turn away from their archaic head, their source, the source of their being, source of themselves. They turn towards the serpent. And, and the subjection is all meant to bring them back, bring them back towards, uh, towards God, the woman towards the man, and the man and the woman towards God. And, and that's, that's why that's, that's archy in a sense, as opposed to the anarchy of the modern world, which right. you know, I've called it that the age of anarchy is the whole uh, modern age there, the rebellion against mm -hmm. hierarchy and then patriarchy or then monarchy and then patriarchy. So, but uh, I think we'll see, I hope, I would hope that we'll, we'll see more clergy um, um, taking up this and being able to teach and that's all they have to do. They don't all have to be on, online yep. advocating on these things. Uh, they don't all that. They don't, they don't have to be as bold as I've been. Um, I'm there for that, and some of them really appreciate that. Um, but uh, but they do need, I would say, they do need to talk about more to their people. They they need to be able to preach this from the ambo. They need to be able to teach it in uh, catechism. Uh, they need to be able to counsel people on this and and continue doing the things that that do teach what the church has always taught you know one for example one of the customs we still preserve in rokor is that we we do church male and female infants differently you know we do bring the the boys through the altar uh and uh, uh, or, uh and, and of course you know leave the women or the girl children not not through the altar and this just makes a difference that there is a different calling here for men and women and uh, men do have the responsibility for altar service and the great thing about Rokor is that we have a lot of men, not just boys, but men serving in the altar. Mm -hmm. And the boys are aspiring to be men. So they're, mm -hmm. they're, they're growing up with the idea that this is something I can do when I'm older too. Um, where, and you need that. You, you need that kind of commitment on the part of men. Because you don't get the buy-in from the men, the, the, the church will wither on the vine. Mm -hmm. The men will leave. And you'll end up with just women, which is what you see in a lot of Protestant denominations there. Right. Preserve those customs. Okay teach the reason for them, uh, I think we, we should be seeing more of that in the future there because people are waking up. One of the claims is that people are leaving these churches that are so patriarchal. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm I like, the it. only place they would do that is in, you know, like maybe really liberal parts of the Northeast where like five people are there already, you know, like nobody's yeah. at these parishes anyway. So that's bizarre. But you you said a really good point too, you know, um, there's a lot of this blame game going around in the world we live in. And, um, you know, men are so, uh, there's some outspoken men, you know, all upset about feminism and they've become like anti-woman. So they're doing like the flip side of feminism, just saying, you know, it's called, you know, MGTOW, men going their own way, that we don't need women and all this kind of thing. But, um, you know, so that it, it plays both sides of this. But my my argument to that is, well, I'm anti-feminist, but men allowed it to happen. So just remember that yeah. men, you know, oh, yeah. good men stand up you know, this can be stopped yeah. in its tracks. But something else very, I think, dramatic that these people push is they're very anti-Paul. They just don't, they don't like the Apostle Paul. Oh, um, really? Yeah. <laughs> I have well. found that. And I don't know if Carrie has talked about that. Mm -hmm. But when you say the when you say that things are anti-Semitic, a lot of times that's what they're talking about is Paul because he's preaching, you know, bringing Christianity to the Gentiles, talking to the Jews, all these kinds of things. And I've done research on the word, you know, like anti-Semitic and where it comes from and all this kind of stuff. But very early on, I met a Matushka, not my current Matushka in any way, shape or form. And um, I was telling her about my friend who um, in Protestantism, who just didn't like Paul. She thought Paul was like a plant and whatever, you know. So, And then this Matushka had said, yeah, I'm not a real big fan of Paul either. So these people exist. These wow. people exist in orthodoxy and they just don't think Paul's that great of a guy. So that's something for you all to hold on to. If father and I have not convinced you and you are a Christian, just remember that. <laughs> And then um, I guess the last thing I was going to say um, is something that Carrie brings up in her book is the word anti-incarnational. What does that mean? What is she talking about there? Is she just making up a word? Well, uh, yeah, I think she is actually. Uh, 
her That's big what I thought. <laughs> because she offers a what a third way. She's one of these people offers a third way, and you know because she does in her book contrast what she calls the Edenic model, which is sort of the traditional understanding of God created man, male and female, you know, and set things up this way, and you just live with it, you know, go with it. Uh, and then the uh, eschato eschatological model, which she attributes largely to Gregory of Nyssa, which is that Greek understanding about in a sense, transcending male and female and basically doing away with it. And, and she offers what uh, she calls something in the middle of the incarnational way, which, which basically is about recognizing that we do have bodies and that men, are, men and women are different. She, you know, she's not so radical that she denies that men and women are different. She's more of an old fashioned feminist whose feminism is based upon an, uh, an insistence that women are different and therefore, we need to, you know, give them a voice because they have different voices, you know, different concerns, different ideas, um, different understandings, and men can't possibly understand them, can't possibly speak for them. And that, I mean, that's it's a denial uh, in the sense. In the beginning of Origins Revenge, in the first preface, in fact, I, I lay out why I'm not approaching this from a feminist standpoint. And, and one of the points is is that it, traditionally. Oh, we would understand, I understand, and Christians would understand that men and women actually can agree on a lot of things, that they're both human beings. Uh, they, they, the, yes, there are differences. Nevertheless, they, they can still reason in the same way, come to the same understanding of things. They're not so different that, that they're just strangers. Whereas the feminism emphasizes the, the strangeness part. You know, women cannot, men cannot speak for women because women are different. And, and that's largely what she makes of this incarnational thing. You have to recognize and embrace and acknowledge and admit this incarnational presence of women to the church, which she feels has been denied. Now, she doesn't have anything good to say about the incarnational nature of men. She, hmm. she really doesn't have anything good to say about men at all in her book. Yeah. And, and, and her talk about the incarnational significance of women is, is really very vague, too. Uh, and in my review in, in Rule of Faith Journal, I, I list several quotes, which basically is all she says about it. And 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 they're just they're just uh, a lot of it is just the ways that a lot of Orthodox personalists have talked for decades, actually, about how we need to honor the distinctiveness of people, you know, the, your, their uniqueness, you know, treat them as persons and not devalue them. I mean, this is just part of the standard leftist view of things now. And, uh, and certainly part of the, uh, the feminist view is that, oh, we've devalued women because we, we haven't let them be part of the you know, leadership. Um, I mean, from the beginning to end, she complains about men being in charge. Right. And, 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 and so because men are in charge, oh, we haven't taken an incarnational view of women, of uh, an understanding of you know, that reality. Uh, for her, it, it means we, we, you know, we've got to be feminist because that's been left out. Um, you know, never mind that right there on the Conestas, you have Our Lady, you know, right next to Our Lord. Uh, it's, it's surprising how many, how little that matters to people. All these female saints, you know, the whole wall on the north side is female saints. A wall on the south side is male saints. And out there in the Conestas, you've got the divine man and the divinized woman, and they're side by side. You know, not paramours, mm -hmm. not lovers, you know, not husband and wife, which is, you know, significant, but a woman and a man, different callings, different roles to play in our salvation. And a woman's a mother. And yet feminists are, well, some of them don't like Mary. You, know, you talk about don't knock like in Paul. Some of them don't like Mary. Because in Mary, orthodoxy? In orthodoxy, yes. You know, now that's a new one. You stumped she, me. <laughs> she does not there. You know, she that's not she doesn't come across as any kind of feminist in the Bible. And the emphasis on her wow. her maternity and and her, uh, you know, demureness, her silence uh, is is something that uh, that they don't really know what to make of. There. Wow. They'd much rather uh, focus on uh, female saints. Uh, like uh, St. Catherine of Alexandria or St. Thecla, you know, because she's said to go out and preach to people and whatnot. Actually, she doesn't do anything inconsistent with what St. Paul says, uh, but she does. She is rather bold at her trial, as martyrs often were, St. Thecla, um, and, uh, and then other female saints, which they like to point to. Um, uh, wow. Laura, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it's, Mary, is, they, they, they really, they don't make a whole lot of Mary, the Theotokos. Because, uh, you know, she doesn't, 
her role in our, our life. Uh, I, uh, poetically, yes, we call her the champion leader, you know, the queen of heaven, or the queen of the apostles. You know, poetically, we use a lot of those things, but that's all a reference to her humility uh, right. and to her, uh, her obedience to God. Uh, and to her maternity, because she's seen as a, a virgin and a mother. I mean, that's basically, basically how she's presented in the tradition. Right. That's, you know, the sorts of, that's who she is. And they're not about that. They're not about being virgins, and they're not yeah. about being <laughs> So, yeah. I mean, um, if she had just tried to get a PhD, everything would be fine. <laughs> <laughs> right. Or written something. Right. right. <laughs> Oh man, I'm gonna have to find some stuff on there. Oh goodness. A um, couple more questions. You had said earlier, you think the schism is already happening. I mean, is it like a cold schism and it's just gonna keep happening? Uh, I mean, I no. just the, just one day it's gonna drop and people are gonna be like, no, we're not into that or we are. And then the separating will happen. Uh, you just you just can't see it changing because it really is. I, I've spoken of in terms of continental drift is that, uh, yeah, the, the traditional orthodoxy and progressive orthodoxy have been drifting apart for a long time, for decades, if not a, centuries. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the, it's this drift and uh, it happens by degrees, a lot of effort, uh, at least on the part of the, uh, the, I think the traditionalists, not to aggravate things. Uh, I think the Russians have been actually very, the Russian church has been very cautious and very deliberate in, in, uh, in, in doing what it's doing, that it doesn't make things worse. Uh, but on the other side, you've got uh, the Archbishop of the Greek Archdiocese in, in, the, in the Americas, El Pidoforos. You've got him just, just, just um, daring to, in doing these outrageous things that, uh, that th he's been told will just cause a, a, a break uh, in communion. There, you know, with the baptizing of the two surrogate children for the gay couple in Athens, oh, and now man. lately, you know, threatening to make a bishop of this of this man who's been uh, uh, um, laicized by Rocor in in in, in schism there. Um, and you know, fortunately, in that case, in that case, the hierarchs of the other churches in the U.S. Uh, the the primates, the the or at least the uh, uh, the heads of the uh, other churches. The OCA, the Antiochians, uh, the Romanians, and the Serbians have stood up and said, "We're not going to tolerate this." So, uh, you know, you may not go forward with it now, but uh, but you don't see any real desire on the part of uh, many people on the other side to to reconcile at all. They they're with the world. Um, they are with the governments of the world, culture of the world. Uh, it pays well. Um, there's government money involved in a lot of these things. And uh, I mean, that's that's what got St. Nicholas that that chapel built in Manhattan. They were it was destroyed by 9-11. A lot of, uh, you know, money uh, came in from governments to support that. And um, the, uh, uh, you know, that's that's the that's the master some people serve um, and they're going to go with that. They think that's the way to the future. And just same things happening in the Roman Catholic Church. You know, they have a, a pope who wants to do this. Um, and yeah, there's a there's a play by the ecumenical patriarch for for a papal authority, basically, uh, for taking that same role uh, and then bringing the churches together. And then, of course, you know, all the other religions together. Uh, they the, a lot of people on the other side really think that that's the way the future has to go, uh, because if you don't go along with that, then you have to bear the cross of Christ. Then you have to suffer. Right. They don't want to do that. And, and yet that's what the faith is all about. So. Right. And then when people on this side, you said it was like progressive orthodoxy versus traditional orthodoxy question bishops. Well, we know what happens when you question bishops that all happened in 2020 and you're toxic and you're, you know, back then you were grandma killers. I don't know what we would be uh, called now. Just, I don't know, white supremacists yeah. or something. Who the heck knows? But something silly. Um, but yeah. I don't want schism. I don't want to pray for schism, right? I pray for the unity of the church, but in a way, it'll be like refreshing. It'll be like truth and advertising. You know, this yeah. is what y'all believe, and the rest of us believe this. Your choice. Good yeah. luck. You know, like. Well, and that's that's what God gives us sometimes: good man, bad man, right? You know, Barabbas. <laughs> you know, pick one. Uh, yes, uh, that's when things get really bad. The difference of good and evil becomes quite plain. Yeah. And you pick. 
So. It, yeah, sometimes oh, these yeah. issues are black and white, you know, yeah. and reading yeah. a lot of these scholars and they use this highfalutin language. And it's not that I'm an idiot, but sometimes I'm like, okay, <laughs> I know what you're saying. And it has nothing to do with those 10 syllable words. You know, I could see clear as day that you're pushing whatever the agenda is. Okay, so this is my last question. So we don't want um, female deaconesses. We don't want them being deacons. We don't want them being priests. What do you think about choir directors singing in the choir, women on parish councils? Is that like a parish centric thing? Whatever you think is good for the rector, that's how it should go. Um, as long as they're not readers or or deacons or altar servers. But you, you always have to start with the principle. You know what's best. Now God always gives us, the, in a sense, there's always a better way. You know, the, the better way is for us all to be monks and uh, not marry one uh, but you know we're actually not all called to that right now um but there you can always do more uh you need to recognize the principle and there there is a principle of male leadership uh male headship uh in which case yeah it's you know may, it's not the best thing to put a woman in charge um but it's a fallen world and uh and and sometimes well that but things just might end up that way uh, that uh, the only person able to direct the choir is a woman uh, and some choir direct, you know, I, I've seen a, a big difference in choir directors. The older female choir directors were a lot more respectful of men in my experience than the younger generation. And so they could pull it off mm -hmm. with less problem. Uh, but I've seen a lot of younger choir director, female choir directors that don't have a lot of, they tend to you know, treat, treat people like children. Uh, and, and when you treat men like that, men just decide not to come to practice, mm -hmm. and not to sing with the choir. And uh, and, and in, so in general, you're better off with a male choir director. Um, uh, as far as the other roles, well, you know, ideally, you know, there, again, there's a better way. But, uh, you know, you, it, it depends on the situation in terms of whether you want, not you want to have a rule that allows this or what. It's what people can tolerate, what they're able mm -hmm. to bear. Um, you know, I, I, you do have to draw the line at some point. Yeah, I'm comfortable where where we've drawn it within Rocor is there is that we we don't have women reading the epistle, mm -hmm. um, and uh, which is done in other churches there. Um, you know, I you know the, the, the Antiochians are great people, and I love to be with them, and I worship in their churches for a while, and my daughter and son-in-law go to one of those uh, churches. But but uh, but but you know, you'll see a woman with a uh, short dress, get up there facing the people reading the epistle. Um, and <laughs> short dress, but a head covering. Yeah, yeah. I so, love yeah. that. <laughs> I know, like, what? Yeah, <laughs> six inches above the knees, and they've got hair. But, um, but uh, what you do with you can. I mean, you, the uh, in a sense, we're all children. We are all children, mm -hmm. and God is patient with us that we're not more adult, Thank uh, God. right? <laughs> <laughs> and and that's the same way that clergy have to be with people and, and people have to be with people. I mean, yes. we, we have to recognize that we're all children and you can expect everybody to live up to the same adult standard. Right? Yeah. So so that's that's the, the, the case there is that focus on the principle, teach the principle, mm -hmm. and usually the practices will fall into place. And then you can maintain respect for the principles by those practices. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, some of the practices you can use, you know, for that purpose. But uh, but but you can't insist on the practice and not teach the principle. Mm -hmm. and that's the problem: is that we've had practices and we haven't defended them. Yeah. Uh, you know, we had we we haven't made women priests up until now. We haven't really had a good explanation for why. Mm -hmm. And there are some very bad ones that have been tried in the past. You know, yeah. people making this argument that somehow all oh, the priest is an icon of Christ. Oh, so you have to have a beard to be a priest. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to look like a man. Just look like Christ. Uh, I mean, it just begs the question. And that argument is never in the fathers. The fathers never made that argument. Right. Their argument for why men can't be priests was simply that, well, women can't rule over men. Women can't be the head of the assembly. That's given to the man. That's his responsibility. It's, that's on him. So, you know, that that's that's the problem. We haven't taught the principle. Uh, and, and so, of course, we couldn't maintain the practices. Yeah. But teach the principle. And sometimes the practice will fall into line. You won't even have to insist on it people will just start doing the right thing because it's they know it's the right thing. Well, I'm glad you reached out to me because, you know, this isn't stirring the pot and, you know, fanning a flame that's tiny, you know, um, 
it, it's something that's growing. And then, like you said, you know, I think it's time to get out ahead of this and, you know, let's take it head on. And, you know, I think like a leftist sometimes, because I used to be one for so long, but really what they could do, if this doesn't fly, they could just have a young girl, um, you know, go up to the altar and say, I identify as a boy. And there she goes. Okay. If they don't set, a, if they don't set I hope I'm not giving them ideas. I'm sure they've thought about this because it seems so obvious to me. Or, you know, a woman, a grown woman who just says, well, I identify as a man. I want to be a deacon. So, you know, let's get started. So I think it's time rubbers meeting road now. And I, I think this all needs to be discussed about. And all of your work that I've had a chance to get to, um, I have not read your books, but I will be remedying that soon. But um, you're just doing such good work, and um, I'm going to link to all that. Are there any um, parting thoughts that you have, anything that we didn't touch on? And of course, I'll link to your website as well. Oh, thanks. I just want to thank you for what you're doing, because that's what no, it's really needed, uh, is it needs to get out there. I'm terrible at publicity there. I just hate trying to draw, get people's attention there but uh but sometimes in this case it's just like I, I, we just should have been friends a long time ago really <laughs> and, uh, and finally now that things have gotten to where we are so so that i'm i'm glad thank you for everything you're doing well thank you sometimes you know we all i call it clown world you know it's crazy we're all living in it trying to survive eke out an existence trying to be joyful but you know clown world brings people together like us yeah. so that that's the silver lining <laughs> yeah thank god yeah. Thank God. Well, thank you so much. Um, keep doing what you're doing and um, God bless you and stay tough and strong and, you know, speaking truth. Uh, I really appreciate you coming on the show. You too. Thank you. We'll pray for you. Bye-bye.